Well, it is very good to be with you all. Uh, we weren't sure um, that we were going to be, uh, whether it was last night or this morning, I don't know. The Lord knows. Um, but, it, but being here uh, is a great privilege. I'm humbled by the opportunity. I've already been humbled just by uh, being with some of you already and just hearing about your own ministries and grateful for the, the talks we've already heard. So I'm just, I'm just really glad to be here. I've been waiting since uh, 2019 to get back. Um, so very thankful. And uh, tonight we're going to do uh, what in American football we would call an audible. I don't know if that translates over here, but I got permission from Derek to change the play at the line. So I know your program says that we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 6. I'm going to bring the sermon I had prepared for, for that text into the talk tomorrow, which by the way, I hope also helps answer Marcel's question uh, that we had at the last panel and will in, in, encourage you and hopefully um, help us walk away with a desire to take all that we've learned and bring it back to our, our people. Uh, but one of the reasons I wanted to change this up is because uh, in, in talking with pastors in my own area and talking with Derek, uh, it seems like it'd be very important or a good idea to just come and encourage you with the text that's, I think, especially helpful uh, for pastors who might be discouraged in the work or intimidated by the work. And so we're going to be in Exodus 4 tonight. But before we turn there, let me just pray once, once more for our time. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that we've heard today. And Father, thank you for Jesus. And Lord, we pray that as we turn to your word, that we would be pointed towards him at this time, that he would be lifted up, not only from your word, but in our hearts, that we might also be strengthened to go and serve him and serve his people. So bless this time now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What gives you confidence in the ministry? Is it your leadership skills, your creative ideas, your speaking ability, or something else about you that gives you confidence in the ministry? Be honest. Where do you find confidence? Or to get at this question a different way, what discourages you in the work? What keeps you from doing the work of the ministry with all your heart? I don't know about you, but those are questions that I need to answer. I need to answer them for myself because people today don't just question the truth of Christianity, but the goodness of it. We've been talking a lot about the Bible. We're here at a biblical theological conference, and yet we know people today don't just question whether or not the Bible is true, but whether or not it's good. Even those inside the church who might say they love Jesus and believe the Bible, and so agree with my counsel as their pastor, will continue to live as if the promises of God aren't true, as if sin is better, and that makes ministry really hard. So where do you find confidence in the ministry? How do you plan on fulfilling whatever it is that God has called you to do? How do you plan on persevering in serving your church in whatever capacity that is, or being satisfied in your work? Like the sermons you may preach. Where does your confidence come from? Well, friends, I want us to let God answer that question for us from Exodus chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 17. 1 through 17. While you're turning there, let me just set the context of this chapter. We're basically reading about Moses' call to ministry here. 
And to be clear, it's a unique call for a unique purpose. So if you're here, you're a student, or I was talking with someone earlier who's in a different job, thinking about becoming a pastor. If you're, if you're one of those people evaluating a call to ministry, don't go looking for a burning bush after this sermon. There are ways in which this passage can only apply to Moses and to the future deliverer of God's people, who is greater than Moses. And yet, Jesus, who Moses points us to, says to us, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. So as we look at Moses and ultimately to Christ, I think there are principles here for every Christian and especially pastors. So back in chapter 2, we look at a guy who thought he was a pretty big deal. Uh, Moses was going to take on Egypt, one Egyptian at a time. Not smart. So 40 years later, he's in the desert, has had a total reality check. He's a nobody. But in chapter 3, God appears to Moses and says, I've heard, I've seen, and I'm coming to rescue my people, so I'm sending you back to lead my people out of Egypt. And that's when the excuses start to roll off Moses' tongue, starting with God who am I? To which God replies, I am who I am. And that's so instructive for us. It should be obvious to God's servants that what's needed in ministry isn't self-sufficiency, but God-sufficiency. And yet that's not so easy for people of many weaknesses like us to learn. God's sufficiency can be a hard lesson to learn for people who are very aware of their weaknesses and the challenges before them. That's why there's so much to learn from this passage, not because of who Moses is, but because who he is not. And ultimately, that leads us to Christ, who is the one who's greater than Moses, that prophet that Moses spoke of that God would raise up one day. And I pray that as a minister of Christ, you'll find your confidence in him tonight, today, for the work that he's called you to. So we pick up the conversation in chapter four with Moses making excuses, but God graciously and patiently blowing up those excuses. And he does that with himself. God can and will fulfill all his promises and plans through his chosen servant. And as we look at this, I pray each one of us will look to Christ and what God has done through him and therefore lean on God's power for doing God's work today. If you're going to take away one thing from from this sermon, one thing to do, one major application, it's that. It's, It's that you would lean on God's power for doing God's work. That's where your confidence should be. And that's what we're encouraged to do in this text in two ways. First, trust in his assurances. This is going to be verses 1 through 9. And second, rely on his sufficient help. That's the verses 10 through 17. So trust in his assurances, rely on his sufficient help. So first, trust in his assurances. Look at verse 1. Moses answered, what if they won't believe me and will not obey me, but say, the Lord did not appear to you? This is his first excuse. No one's going to believe me. There's a sense in which right now the relationship between God and Moses is just getting started and Moses is trying to end it already. Moses is basically coming out and saying, God, it's not you, it's them. I have doubts about my ministry, not because of you. I know you're with me. Yes, God has already told him that. But God, it's them. What if they have doubts and and deny that you're with me? In other words, he's anticipating a familiar question from his hearers. One that you might fear some of your hearers have. Did God really say Is he, preacher Moses, really speaking through you? After all, this is Moses. 
I mean, based on his past failures, why should anyone, including Moses, believe that God would call him to do this work? Well, there's no good reason. Hallelujah. God doesn't answer Moses with a, with a page out of modern psychology that says something like, Moses, don't say that about yourself. Just believe in who you are. Instead, God gives him reasons to believe in God. Assurance for the people that God is with Moses. Verse 2. The Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. Throw it on the ground, he said. So Moses threw it on the ground. It became a snake, and he ran from it. The Lord told Moses, stretch out your hand and grab it by the tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. This will take place, he continued, so that they will believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. In addition, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. So he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was diseased, resembling snow. Put your hand back inside your cloak, he said. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, it had be, again become like the rest of his skin. If they will not believe you and will not respond to the evidence of the first sign, they may believe the evidence of the second sign. And if they don't believe even these two signs or listen to what you say, take some water from the Nile and pour it out on the dry ground. The water you take from the Nile will become blood on the ground. God is graciously meeting Moses' fear with miraculous signs that aren't just there for Moses, but there to assure that his people will know that God has appeared to him. The first sign involves a serpent, a symbol of resurrection in Egypt, and then leprosy, which is a kind of living death, obviously believed to be incurable. The turning of water into blood represents God's power over two things that are essential to life, right? Water and blood. But each miracle is proclaiming that God has sovereign control over every part of human existence, the most important parts, life and death. Now, here's why those signs are so important. Because if God has appeared to Moses, then he's speaking and working through Moses to bring about his promised deliverance of his people. And to believe that God has appeared to Moses as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is to be assured of that, of that deliverance. He's keeping his promises that he's made. To see Moses perform these signs as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is to say, that God who made promises is with me. He's doing this. He's doing this. So these signs are hugely important for God's people. They're connected to the promises, which must be believed for deliverance. So God's graciously addressing Moses' fear and gives not one sign or two, but if necessary, three. Now, why in the world would more than one or two be necessary? I'm thinking that stick to snake thing would have been enough. <laughs> Never mind the whole thing with the hand. I mean, that, that would do it for me. <laughs> but when it comes to hearing God's word and believing it, the human heart needs its own miracle. And realize that Moses is going to speak to people who, after 400 years of being enslaved and God not doing anything, combined with their own sinful hearts, engaging in worshiping the idols of Egypt, according to Ezekiel 20. I think we understand, especially as pastors, why Moses might have had these fears. God, why would they listen to me when they don't even listen to you? Of course they're not going to believe me. Is that not a temptation for you as a preacher? Week after week, preaching the same message. Preaching to the people who, who may not even be seeking freedom from their own bondage to sin. And remain unconverted. Are you tempted, if you're the main preacher at your church, are you tempted 
next Sunday to think, how do I really know that God is with me in this pulpit? How do I know that God really said? Praise God. He's given us assurance. Listen, Moses is God's prophet. He's God's chosen servant. And through him, God will lead his people out of slavery and in Egypt. And these miraculous signs serve as proof of God's saving power. God's people will see, they will believe, and they will follow him. Because God's presence is with him. And we can say all these same things because God has given us similar assurances today. When the Pharisees said to Jesus, show us a sign so that we may know that you're from the Lord. What does Jesus say? He says, a wicked and rebellious generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given them except the sign of Jonah. Referring to his own resurrection over death. Right? God's power over death. We have the sign in the historical resurrection. So just like God did for Moses with the staff, he's done much more for us. Jesus is the promised prophet that Moses spoke of before his death. He's God's chosen servant. He's Emmanuel, God with us, and Jesus has conquered death. It's the sign of his resurrection that proves that his death on the cross is the power to save people from their sins including ourselves and those that hear us preach. And he has given us his Holy Spirit, the seal of his promise, assurance that he will be with us to the end of the age. That's what he promised in Matthew 28. That's why we obey the call to preach the gospel. That's why we can continue to work hard each week at understanding the text and bring it to bear on our sermon. That's why we can get up on Sunday in, and in confidence of the Holy Spirit, proclaim God's word to people who are in bondage to their sin and may not even be looking to be delivered. Or people who struggle deeply with unbelief. So just like Moses, we're given these signs of assurance. People will know. And so Moses went and he preached, and God redeemed his parents, or redeemed his people. And whereas our first parents in the garden questioned what God said, and they were sent into exile, here, God is speaking to sinful rebels. And if they believe, they'll be brought back into the land of promise with God, enjoying his presence. So, to preach God's word is to participate in, in the redemptive work of God. So be honest. Why do you think people will listen to you when you preach? Praise the Lord for his grace that it's not because of you or because of them. It doesn't depend on us or them, but on him. And we can look to the cross and resurrection the, the giving of his spirit, and know you can have confidence that he has come, that God has spoken through Jesus, and he is with us. So I want to encourage you, do the work. And do it without fear. Do it expecting God to save. And yet, do it, keep it in mind, that while it... These, these signs convinced God's people. They didn't convince everyone. A Pharaoh found these same signs quite unconvincing, which is a helpful reminder not to find our confidence even in the signs he gives us. The power really isn't in the signs or the results of the signs, but in God himself who determines what to do with them. We can know that the cross was stained with blood. We can know that the tomb was empty. And so we can have assurance to do this work with confidence. But we can also know that not everyone will believe. Everyone saw the signs, but only God's people are saved. It's not the results that give us confidence. It's not even the signs. 
It's the assurance of God's presence and his power to do what he wants for his people. So we lean on him by trusting in his assurance that he's with us and by relying on his sufficient help in our weaknesses, which is what we learn in Moses' next excuse. So rely on his sufficient help. Look at verse 10. But Moses replied to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in the past or recently or since you have been speaking to your servant, because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. The Lord said to him, Who placed a mouth on humans? Who makes a person mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. After all these excuses in chapter 3 and then going into chapter 4, it's, it's almost as if Moses has been convinced. He's almost ready to go, but not yet. Okay, God, you're trustworthy, and now I can see that you're going to make your presence known with me, but it's not just them, okay? It's not you, it's not them, it's me. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm not a great speaker. And that might make sense to Moses or maybe to you, based on your own weaknesses, whatever that might be. And yet God says that's irrational. If God is with him, then he doesn't need to worry about what people will say or do, and he doesn't need to worry about what he can't say or do. You know, I've been serving in my church long enough to see my weaknesses start to stare back at me in the church, if you know what I mean. I've been at Grace Harbor for nearly 14 years next month, uh, and I can, I can see my weaknesses now being manifested in the very people I serve. I, I know I have weaknesses. That's clear. And it's not just that. I, I, it's not just that I make mistakes. I'm a sinner. So I get Moses. And yet, what God is saying is that if I am with you, all fear is, our, is as irrational as the monster underneath your kid's bed even when it comes to your specific weakness, like Moses' inability to speak. Why? Because God made the mouth to speak, and he made the ears to hear. Moses shouldn't worry about his ability to speak and what God wants his people to hear. Just say what God tells you to say. That will be enough. Every objection to obedience Every fear that obedience induces is irrational, especially, especially when it comes to preaching God's word. If God demands it, he will supply it. That, that which God demands, he provides, plain and simple, every time. Even the impossible. He speaks to the dead, live, and the dead man rises. I mean, if there was ever an excuse that a preacher had, it was Ezekiel, right? These are dry bones. But God says, prophesy to them, and the bones take on flesh. You may have 10, more than 10,000 objections to your leadership, objections to the wisdom that you have, the knowledge you have, the skills you have. It might be the very specific challenges to your ministry and your church. But you have nothing to fear. It doesn't depend on Moses. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on God and the one that Moses points us to. Jesus is God's faithful servant, and he accomplished everything needed for your ministry to be effective. And he has given you his spirit. That God's word might be proclaimed with power. And he has promised that he will be with us. In fact, what God says here in verse 12 to Moses sounds a lot like what Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 12, verse 12. The Holy Spirit will teach you in that hour what is necessary to say. So both in Exodus and in Luke, the promise to those who are called to speak, potentially in very dangerous situations is that God will be with them and guide them in what to say. Brothers, when we stand up to proclaim God's word, how much more 
confident should we be that God is with us and that his spirit is leading us? That he has been with us in our study and that he will speak with us through us in our pulpit. He has given us Jesus. I mean, Moses is, is holding out. Uh, he's, a, he's a faithful servant in many ways, but he, he's a sinner still. He's weak. Jesus has accomplished all that Moses pointed to. And we have his spirit. So if your confidence is in him, then I hope what you're learning in this, conf- in this conference will motivate you to work hard on communi- communicating what God has prepared for us to say in his word as he's given it to us. And it's, how, it's why we're here this week. We, we, we want to understand the Bible well. We want, to, we want to put it together rightly so we get the text that we're preaching right. We want to communicate it clearly because we're dependent on God to do what only he can do. And he does it through his word. All of us in ministry should want to work hard to teach the people that we're serving where the power comes from for real spiritual life. It does not depend on us. Fix their eyes on Jesus. Those that you serve with the word, fix their eyes on the author and perfecter of their faith. Get out of the way. And don't be afraid of your weaknesses. Boast in them like Paul. That's how your hearers will know that it is the Lord who's at work. That's what God's trying to get Moses to see. So what can Moses say now? He's out of, his, he's out of excuses, right? What else can he possibly say? Well, he's not done. <laughs> Verse 13. Moses said, please, Lord, send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and said, Isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and also he is on his way now to meet you. He will rejoice when he sees you. You will speak with him and tell him what to say. I will help both you and him to speak and will teach you both what to do. He will speak to the people for you. He will serve as a mouth for you, and you will serve as God to him. And take this staff in your hand and that you will perform the signs with. Out of excuses... Exhausted with trying, Moses just says, God, the work is too hard for me. Just send someone else. Oh, is that ever a temptation? I mean, honestly, after these last couple of years, everything that, that has gone on with COVID, has it not been a temptation to just have someone come do this, Lord. Send someone else. And there's plenty of Saturday nights the last couple of years where I'm thinking about the sermon I'm going to preach tomorrow, and I'm thinking about the comments I got from last week's sermon. They're still sort of right here, you know, in my head, because maybe they're the type of people who are really upset about COVID and, and angry about all that's going on, and, and I don't seem to be angry, so... Maybe I'm a communist, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> and yet I, have, I know the text before me, and I know how this is going to send so-and-so off, and, oh, man, now I'm going to be dealing with that next Saturday night. And I'm just tired. And so there's just plenty of Saturday nights where I felt like I was saying, God, I just don't want to. I just don't want to. And God's response here, might not be real encouraging at first, but it's instructive and helpful. He's angry. The reason Moses is searching and finding so many excuses is because he's not leaning on the sufficiency of God's power for God's work. He's too fixated on himself. And so at the end of the day, the real issue for him is unbelief. It's in his heart. He doesn't want to go, and the Lord's anger burns against him. Oh, that's convicting. The Lord hates unbelief. What Moses is doing here is an attack on the glory of God. And yet encouraging is the Lord's extreme patience with his servant. 
Aaron is right there. He gets appointed to help. And Moses is told to go. And the conversation ends, and the ministry of Moses begins. This interaction between God and Moses at the outset of Moses' ministry just shows clearly that when it's all said and done, Moses can't get a whole lot of credit for what takes place in Egypt. Moses has been like that little kid that doesn't think he can do his chores. You know, you tell, you, I've got young children, tell them to do something. Like, oh, I can't, I can't. Like suddenly their legs don't work. <laughs> you know? But God doesn't accept any of his excuses. He answers them with his self-sufficiency. When God's people prosper today, there's no reason to look at the human instrument. No reason to think, where would we be without Moses? We're so lucky to have someone like him lead us. But for their eyes to be fixed on the God who makes promises and is able to keep them by his own strength. How does the church that you serve see your ministry? How important do you think you are? How important do they think you are? If the book of Exodus demonstrates that there's only one God, that lesson isn't just for Pharaoh and the rest of Egypt, but for God's people. It's a lesson for Moses and every preacher as well. We want our people to think, to see, it's not how, how great Kevin is. It's about how great God is and how he is communicating his word to us. If we can learn that lesson, then we will decrease and Jesus will increase in our ministry because he's the greater prophet. He's the greater Moses. He came to do the will of the Father, and through his ministry, God was faithful to fulfill all his promises. Through Jesus, God delivered us from a greater tyranny to sin, and to Satan, and to death. And it's through him, our great deliverer, that now we're called to speak. Jesus is sufficient for our ministry. He's everything Moses needed to be, and more. So it's in the power of his spirit, and what he has done in equipping his church with so many different kinds of gifts, that we go about the work of the ministry with confidence. The Lord, the Lord, will accomplish his work. Jesus will build his church. So you want confidence in the ministry? Confidence when you preach? Hear from God in his word by studying to get it right. Grow in your ability to handle the word through growing in biblical theology. Tell God's people what God has said, and lean on his Spirit's help. God will do his work through you by his power. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can go about this impossible work with confidence. And we can do that because Jesus has come and you have raised him from the dead. He has delivered us from sin, Satan, and death, he is victorious, and we go in the power of his spirit. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to grow this week in our understanding of your word, that we might preach it with confidence and see you work. Lord, glorify yourself in this way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.